Uh, I'll be talking to you today about major depressive disorders uh, through a case-based approach and their treatment options. Uh, to start off, I'll give you a basic overview of depression, something that everybody is aware of, but just to point out the scope of the problem. Uh, it is the most common form of mental illnesses. Uh, the worldwide lifetime prevalence of major depressive disorder is around 18%, which is a very high prevalence. Uh, females are more afflicted than males, although some could argue that there is an equal affliction between both sexes. Uh, the most common comorbidity in patients with depression is that of anxiety. And depression can occur in two forms, either as unipolar depression or bipolar depression. Now, how do you diagnose uh, depression? Apart from the obvious aspect of people being sad, but there are actually a set of criteria which need to be followed in order to give a diagnosis of depression. The most important thing is the presence of either sadness of mood or anhedonia. Anhedonia is typically described as a loss of interest in any activity that was previously pleasurable. For example, watching a match, or going out for a movie, going out with friends. The patient just does not feel uh, up to it. The patient does not enjoy doing the same thing that he used to or she used to do earlier. And that is what is described as anhedonia. The duration needs to be of a minimum of 15 days. We do not diagnose depression for a duration less than 15 days. And it needs to cause significant impairment either in your professional life or in your personal life. There are other symptoms which help us diagnose depression. Uh, most of them, most importantly, being psychomotor agitation or retardation. That means either the patient is restless or the patient is very withdrawn, very aloof. Uh, they change in their sleep and diet patterns. They can either sleep more, sleep less, eat more, eat less. Uh, they have this sense of worthlessness. They feel that they're just not worth it. They feel that they cannot be helped. There's no hope. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. They feel very lethargic. They feel very lazy. They don't have the energy to do anything. Even routine tasks tax them. They're not able to come to a decision. This, in fact, is a very important symptom because a lot of patients come to us with this presenting complaint that's in the past few months, I've not been able to come to any decisions. I'm not able to decide. I'm not able to think through, uh, through a problem. Uh, suicidal thoughts or actions, and last and most importantly is guilt. A lot of patients with depression have excessive, inappropriate guilt about very trivial events, about things that they have done in the past which don't really mean so much, but they, that is something that keeps going on in their head. Uh, there are certain specifiers of depression, and most of my cases today will talk about these specifiers, because these are things that we commonly see in clinical practice, but the usual treatment does not seem to help these patients and so we need to tweak certain treatments in order to uh, help them out. The most common is anxious distress, melancholic features, atypical features and seasonal onset. So the, coming to the first case, we have a young female patient, 25 years of age, with a history of major depressive disorder since three years. She has been on treatment. However, currently her main complaints are that of Bejani Gabrahat, which is associated with multiple panic attacks throughout the day. She's preoccupied with the thought of her illness. She has a fear of not being able to get better. And she also has a fear of having a long, lifelong illness, which could be very debilitating. She has been given a trial of multiple SSRIs, escitalopram, fluoxetine, and sertraline, but the patient has responded well to her depressive symptoms, but she does not seem to respond well. Uh, her anxiety symptoms don't seem to respond that well. She has very poor coping skills. She is not ready to work on herself. She is not ready to take in a lot of th psychotherapy. And she has a high novelty seeking. That means she's looking out for new experiences, new expenditures, uh, new ex adventures. So benzodiazepines have not been used regularly because there's a high addiction potential in, these, in this patient. Uh, in this patient, when we evaluated, we found that anxiety levels were very elevated and they were very predominant. There was a poor control of anxiety instead of depression. A trial of an SNRI, which is a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, was considered specifically venlafaxine. We titrated the patient up to 225 milligrams. The rationale for employing venlafaxine was that norepinephrine uh, as a neurotransmitter has a very potent role in anxiety control. Along with that, we added propranolol in the dose range of 40 to 80 milligrams for her anxiety symptoms to be used as an SOS medication instead of benzodiazepines. This allowed us to not worry about the addiction potential of the benzodiazepines, not, allow, not worry about the titration of dose, and uh, provided adequate uh, anxiety relief. The takeaway from this slide is that a uh, SNRIs 
different SNRIs, venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine should be used if a patient has predominant anxiety. Also, beta blockers, propranolol specifically, I've used extensively in my clinical practice for short periods of time, can very easily replace benzodiazepines and do not have the same issue of addiction potential as benzodiazepines. Moving on to the second case, it's a middle-aged male patient with a two-year history, severe sadness of mood, markedly reduced communication, blunted affect. Blunted affect is a state where there are absolutely no expressions on the face. There's feeling of helplessness, worthlessness, and hopelessness. Excessive guilt over the past events, as I talked about earlier, suicidal thoughts and actions, terminal insomnia, and early morning worsening of symptoms. Now, these three things that have been highlighted in red are the triad which indicates severe depression. This form of depression is known as melancholic depression. Depression earlier was categorized into exogenous, that is because of external events or situations, and endogenous, which was because of an intrinsic reduction in neurotransmitters, specifically serotonin in the brain. These, uh, this type of depression, that is melancholic depression, responds best to aggressive pharmacotherapy and neurostimulation. Uh, melancholia basically means black bile, which indicates the severity of this illness. Melancholic depression has a tendency to respond very well to electroconvulsive therapy. In this patient, we gave a combination of ECT with aggressive pharmacotherapy. A total of six ECT sessions were given over a span of 12 days, and the patient showed significant improvement by the end of the third session. The important thing is that ECTs can be given on an OPD basis without the need for even daycare admissions. The only reason for hospitalization in this patient was his tendency to be suicidal, and hence the patient needed to be kept under observation. The third case is really interesting. We had a middle-aged male patient came with complaints of sadness of mood, anhedonia, and changes in his sleep and appetite. On the face of it, it seemed to be like simple depression, nothing too complicated. However, the patient had been under treatment. Various SSRIs, SNRIs, were given, the patient was augmented with multiple drugs, including lithium, but seemed to have very minimal improvement. Upon a detailed discussion, family members reported excessive irritability on being corrected or, or con uh, contradicted. The patient was just very sensitive to criticism. You could say anything and the patient would just lash out at you for no rhyme or reason. It was just excessive. Uh, the patient had a feeling of heaviness in, her, in his body, which was just so severe that the patient was finding it difficult to even move. And the patient's sleep and appetite had increased markedly. And the appetite actually increased before the onset of treatment when the patient was anti, uh, uh, antidepressant naive. These symptoms typically described in this case are seen in patients of atypical depression. In patients of atypical depression, there is a reversal of the vegetative function. Instead of insomnia, the patients have excessive sleep and excessive appetite. They are excessively sensitive to rejection. They just cannot tolerate criticism. They lash out very frequently. And there is a component of latent paralysis. The body becomes like a block of lead. It just becomes very difficult and becomes very heavy for the patient to move. The problem with atypical depression is it does not respond to a trial of SSRIs and SNRIs. It does not respond to conventional medications, and hence the patient was not getting any symptomatic relief. The patient was given a trial of bupropion. We started at 150 milligrams, ended up to 300 milligrams as monotherapy, and the patient responded very well to it. You could also give a trial of tricyclic antidepressants. However, it is advisable to give a trial of bupropion first. Case four, a 25-year-old male patient with a duration of one year, currently in the second episode, came with complaints of sadness of mood, anhedonia, lethargy, excessive daytime sedation, and increased overall sleep duration. Now, based on the last case, we would be tempted to think in terms of atypical depression here. However, relatives reported that these symptoms were seen only during a particular season. And in, in, in verbatim, they said, said, dar varshe, unana time ma, winter period ma, a loko, emne avu thadu hoyche. And after the patient, after the season passes, after winter is over, the patient just resumes normal activity. The patient does not need any changes in his medication, does not need any changes in his uh, routine, and returns back to being normal. The pattern of developing depression is consistent with weather changes. It has been documented, and it has been known as winter depression in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, this, is occur this occurs because of shorter days and less exposure to sunlight. This leads to so changes in the circadian rhythm, leading to a phase early sleep cycle. It can be very distressing to patients, and usually it is seen more in patients with bipolar mood disorder, where they seem to have more manic episodes during summers and more depressive episodes during winters. Usually this type of uh, depression is time-bound. It, it automatically resolves when the season gets over. It does not require very aggressive pharmacotherapy. Melatonin supplementation is the treatment of choice, dosed between 3 to 12 milligrams at bedtime. 
The patient needs to be counseled regarding the time of onset of melatonin because it takes around 20 to 25 days for melatonin to act. Antidepressants can be given as a supportive measure, but do not, uh, the, there is no real need for them. And the only thing is that we need to watch for the emergence of suicidality or suicidal behavior in such patients. This last part of my presentation, I want to talk about, talk about suicidality because it is something that is very common. It's, it's in, increasing. It is the most serious outcome of depression. The current suicide rate as of 2018 is 16.4 per 100,000 women in India and 25.8 per 100,000 men in India. We have the highest suicide rate in Southeast Asia. Suicidal behavior can either be in the form of thoughts or actions. If it is in the form of thoughts, it will eventually translate into actions. And in patients with incomplete attempts, patients who have attempted but have not gone through with it or have they got saved miraculously, guilt is a very important factor and that can precipitate a second attempt, a second suicide uh, attempt. The predictors of suicide, if there is a patient who is coming to you and who is reporting of having a past attempt of suicide, then it is the strongest predictor for future behavior. Predominance of helplessness and guilt in the symptom complex needs to alarm the physician to think about in terms of suicide. There's something known as transfer of care, where basically once the idea of committing suicide has been concreted, it has been cemented in the mind of the patient, the patient completes his or her duties, whether it is professional duties, personal duties, feels a sense of ease, feels a sense of calm, and for everybody else viewing the patient from the outside, it seems that the patient is doing bet better, but this is actually the calm before the storm, and the storm in this case ha is the suicide attempt. The patient has a clear plan of action in mind. A lot of patients come to you, uh, come to us, and they tell us that this is exactly how they are going to do it. Having a clear plan of action is a very high risk for uh, suicide. Online searches for ways and methods to end, end one's life. So ketamine is a newer treatment option. Uh, ketamine can be given as an IV infusion or an intranasal spray. Uh, it causes rapid reduction in suicidal thoughts and behaviors. The dose is 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg body weight. Thank you.